Now Isaiah chapter 60, 61 and 62. Rather a long reading this morning, but it all hangs together and these three chapters are all about the same thing. And in fact they are so straightforward that even if we just read them this morning that would be a great help to us. So let's read right through chapter 60, 61 and 62. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory shall be seen upon you. And all nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes round about and see, they all gather together, they come to you. Your sons shall come from far, and your daughters shall be carried in their arms. Then you shall see and be radiant, your heart shall thrill and rejoice, because the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. The wealth of the nation shall come to you. A multitude of camels shall cover you. The young camels of Midian and Ephah, all those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and frankincense, and shall proclaim the praise of the Lord. All the flocks of Kedar shall be gathered to you. The rams of Nebaioth shall minister to you. They shall come up with acceptance on my altar, and I will glorify my glorious house. Who are these that fly like a cloud and like doves to their windows? For the coastlands shall wait for me, the ships of Tarshish first, to bring your sons from far, their silver and gold with them, for the name of the Lord your God, and for the Holy One of Israel, because he has glorified you. Foreigners shall build up your walls, and their kings shall minister to you. For in my wrath I smote you, but in my favor I have had mercy on you. Your gates shall be open continually. Day and night they shall not be shut, that men may bring to you the wealth of the nations, with their kings led in procession. For the nation and kingdom that will not serve you shall perish, those nations shall be utterly laid waste. The glory of Lebanon shall come to you, the cypress, the plain, and the pine, to beautify the place of my sanctuary, and I will make the place of my feet glorious. The sons of those who oppressed you shall come bending low to you, and all who despised you shall bow down at your feet. They shall call you the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. Whereas you have been forsaken and hated, with no one passing through, I will make you majestic forever, a joy from age to age. You shall suck the milk of nations, you shall suck the breast of kings, and you shall know that I, the Lord, am your Saviour and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. Instead of bronze, I will bring gold, and instead of iron, I will bring silver, instead of wood, bronze, instead of stones, iron. I will make your overseers peace and your taskmasters righteousness. <coughs> Violence shall no more be heard in your land, devastation or destruction within your borders, you shall call your walls salvation and your gates praise. The sun shall be no more your light by day, nor for brightness shall the moon give light to you by night. But the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. Your sun shall no more go down, nor your moon withdraw itself. For the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your days of mourning shall be ended. Your people shall all be righteous. They shall possess the land forever, the shoot of my planting, the work of my hands, that I may be glorified. The least one shall become a clan, and the smallest one a mighty nation. I am the Lord. In its time I will hasten it. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good tidings to the afflicted, he has sent me to bind up the broken heart, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, 
to grant to those who mourn in Zion to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. They shall build up the ancient ruins, they shall raise the former devastations, they shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. Aliens shall stand and feed your flocks. Foreigners shall be your plowmen and vine dressers. But you shall be called the priests of the Lord. Men shall speak of you as the ministers of your God. You shall eat the wealth of the nations and in their riches you shall glory. Instead of your shame, you shall have a double portion. Instead of dishonor, you shall rejoice in your lot. Therefore in your land you shall possess a double portion. Yours shall be everlasting joy. For I the Lord love justice, I hate robbery and wrong. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants shall be known among the nations, and their offspring in the midst of the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge them, that they are a people whom the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. For Zion's sake I will not keep silent, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest, until her vindication goes forth as brightness, and her salvation as a burning torch. The nations shall see your vindication, and all the kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord, and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken, and your land shall no more be termed desolate, but you shall be called, My delight is in her, and your land married. For the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a virgin, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. Upon your walls, O Jerusalem, I have set watchmen all the day and all the night. They shall never be silent. You who put the Lord in remembrance, take no rest and give him no rest until he establishes Jerusalem and makes it a praise in the earth. The Lord has sworn by his right hand and by his mighty arm. I will not again give your grain to be food for your enemies, and foreigners shall not drink your wine for which you have labored. But those who garner it shall eat it and praise the Lord, and those who gather it shall drink it in the courts of my sanctuary. Go through, go through the gates, prepare the way for for the people, build up, build up the highway, clear it of stones, lift up an ensign over the people's, Behold, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the earth, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your salvation comes. Behold, his reward (coughs) is with him, and his recompense before him. And they shall be called the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. And you shall be called, sought out, a city not forsaken. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we are not worthy so much as to gather up crumbs under your table. But you are the same Lord whose property is always to have mercy. And in your mercy you have invited us to sit at your table as your children and to feed our souls upon the living bread which you send down from heaven, even Jesus Christ. We pray that you will quicken our imagination by your Holy Spirit and enable us so to understand that our hearts may thrill 
and we may rejoice and exult in God our Saviour. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <coughs> Six months ago when we began to study the prophet Isaiah, I said that the book of the prophet Isaiah is a Bible in miniature. And this becomes ever more clearer as you study the book. Hope you can all see roughly this board. If you can't, I'm going to repeat everything that's on it, so just listen carefully. Isaiah divides up into 39 and 27 chapters, as the whole Bible divides up into 39 and 27 books. Furthermore, the contents of the two sections of Isaiah are precisely the contents of the two testaments in the Bible. The first 39 chapters tend to concentrate on the judgment and the justice of God and the sins of the people, with promises of salvation to come. But when you get into the next half of Isaiah, the 27 chapters from 40 onwards, you're reading the New Testament. Chapter 40 begins with a voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, which is of course John the Baptist, and that's where the Gospel begins in the New Testament. By chapter 42, God's servant, whom we now know to be Jesus Christ, steps into the pages. Behold my servant, in whom I am well pleased. And here is Jesus Christ. And from then through the next few chapters, we have the life of Jesus portrayed in Isaiah. Hundreds of years before it took place. When we get to chapter 53, as we saw when we studied that chapter, we've come to the death and resurrection of Jesus very clearly portrayed he was wounded for our transgressions bruised for our iniquities and yet after his death God would prolong his days then in chapter 55 we had the preaching of the good news equivalent to the first preaching of the gospel in Acts by Peter and so on through the New Testament but chapters 60 to 66 and by the way the last three studies in Isaiah were within sight of the end the last chapters, 60 to 66, correspond exactly to the book of Revelation in the New Testament. And the three studies that we are going to have the next three Sunday mornings to finish off Isaiah cover the three main subjects of the last part of the New Testament. This morning's chapters cover the New Jerusalem. And the next study, next week, chapters 63 and 64, cover the final judgment. And finally, chapters 65 and 66 are about the new heaven and the new earth. And if you've got a Bible with cross-references at the foot of the page, you will discover that from chapter 60 onwards, there is a reference to the book of Revelation at the foot of every page. So we've virtually reached the end of Isaiah and the end of the New Testament at one and the same time. Now that just gives you the setting. Therefore, from now on, chapter 60 onwards... God is unveiling the future, and the Greek word for unveiling is apocalypse. That's why we call it the apocalypse of John at the end of the New Testament. An apocalypse is drawing back the curtain from the future. Now, no one else in the world can do that but God. No one can draw back the veil from the future. You can read all your horoscopes, you can study the stars... You can get someone to read your hand. But there's only one person can draw aside the veil from the future. Your future and the future of the world. And that's God. And this he has done. And shown us as much as we need to know about the end of the world. To keep our faith balanced and sane. Now one of the problems of course in discussing the future. Is that it's so difficult to imagine it. We can imagine the past much easier than we can imagine the future. If I gave you a lecture this morning on social life in Britain, 100 years ago, with a little bit of imagination, even though none of you were alive then, with a little bit of imagination, you could see the reality of it. But if I were able to describe to you social life in Britain 100 years hence, you would find it very difficult to imagine. If I had told my grandfather in the 1930s that one day he'd be able to sit by his fireside and watch things happening in Japan, he would have left. He would have thought I, I was touched, but I, I wouldn't have been. It is just that it's so difficult to imagine the future. And when we come to those sections of the Bible that are about the future, 
They tend to be a little unreal because it's so difficult to imagine these things happening. But I want to say to you that everything God has promised to do in the future, he will do. And however difficult it is to imagine such things happening, they are going to happen as certainly as the things he has promised for our past have already happened. And so we confidently go into these chapters. You really need a painter rather than a preacher. They're full of picture language. They're full of artistry. They're full of colour. They're full of wonderful glimpses of things that only an artist could get down on canvas. And so really all I'm going to do this morning is try and paint pictures in words and try and show you the future in your mind's eye. We begin then with chapter 60. All these three chapters say exactly the same thing. But they approach the same subject from three different angles. The first chapter approaches the subject from a world angle. A world angle. The second approaches it from the angle of the people. The third approaches it from the angle of the city itself. But all are about the New Jerusalem, about the Zion of the future which God is to establish. And the paintings are three paintings from different angles of this city. The first chapter sees the New Jerusalem as the centre of a world civilization, as the capital city of the universe. It sees the New Jerusalem as the centre to which the traffic of the world pours in to which the nations and the kings of the whole world come. Do you notice how often the words nation and kings occurred as I read? Just glance down at your Bible, verse 3 of chapter 60. Nation shall come to your light, kings to the brightness of your rising. Look down at uh, verse 11. That men may bring to you the wealth of the nations with their kings led in procession. And then verse 12, nations again. Look at verse 16, you shall suck the milk of nations, you shall suck the breast of kings. Here is a world civilization with the nations and the kings all coming to Jerusalem, to God's city. Not to New York, not to London, not to Tokyo, not to Babylon, but to Jerusalem as the centre, the focal point. If you go to Jerusalem today, and some of us hope to in just a fortnight now, we hope to go to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. And there in the floor is a large silver star, an inlaid silver star in the stone floor. And the guide will point to it and will say, that is the centre of the world. I don't know how it got there or why they say this, but that's what they say. And in a sense it's true. It is the meeting point of Asia, Africa, Europe. And if you include the Americas, who are now virtually linked by modern transport so closely to Europe, this is the centre of world civilization. Look at the world from one angle and you'll see hardly anything but sea. If you've got the Reader's Digest World Atlas, there are some wonderful pictures of the world from 25,000 miles away. And from one angle there's hardly anything but sea. Look at it from another angle and you can see all the continents from one angle. And if you take your pencil and go like that in the middle of it, you'll land on Jerusalem. It is the centre of the world in which people live. And this is the vision for the future. Jerusalem not only is the centre, but kings and nations coming as pilgrims to Jerusalem. Now why? What is making them come? The answer is in verses 1 to 9. Because that's the only place in the world they can clearly see the glory of the Lord. That's why. Or to put it very simply, because the rest of the world will be in darkness and that will be the only place in light. And people in darkness go to someone who's got a bit of light. Darkness and light in the Bible are moral and spiritual qualities. To be an evil man is to be a dark man. To walk in darkness, to be a good man is to walk in light as he is in the light. And here we have a wonderful situation. Arise, shine, for God's light, God's glory, God's goodness is shining on you. And the rest of the world is in darkness and they're all coming to see how you got that light. They want the light, they're seeking the light and so they come to you. Now the language of verses 1 to 3 is the language of an eastern dawn, which we never see here. Some of you have seen an eastern dawn, but you don't see it in this country. We see the slow 
change from darkness to that duskiness to dawn to the sun. And at night we see the slowly gathering shadows of the twilight and the gloom of sunset. But in the Middle East, the sun seems to jump up. One minute it seems to be dark, and then before you know where you are, there's the sun blazing down upon you. And it's a wonderful experience to watch the sunrise in Jerusalem. Coming up over the Mount of Olives, suddenly the sun is there in the sky. There is no slow change. The sun springs into action. That's why the Psalms speak of the sun as springing into his circuit, coming forth like a bridegroom out of his chamber, jumping into being and shining upon people. And suddenly the city of Jerusalem is bathed in full sunlight. That's dawn in the Middle East. And the sun goes down just as quickly. Six o'clock every morning it comes up. Six o'clock every night it goes down. Just like that. One half hour it's dark and half an hour later it's blazing light. When our arise shine Jerusalem because God's shining upon you. His glory is here. And people know that here they can find God. God is shining in this place. Darkness over all the peoples but upon you. God is risen and is shining. So they come. And the nations and the kings come. This is what Jerusalem has to give to the world. Jerusalem as a city ought not to have survived. It's not on a river. It's not on a main trading route. It isn't on a prominent site. Jerusalem has no reason to survive. Babylon had. The cities of Assyria had. The cities of Egypt had. And yet none of them have survived. But this one has. Isn't that remarkable? I think it's just as big a miracle that Jerusalem is still on the map as that Israel is. When all these other cities that really had a point have gone. But there's only one thing that Jerusalem had to offer the world and that she still has to offer and will offer more gloriously in the future and that is God. She cannot offer commerce. She cannot offer good trading centers. Go to Tel Aviv for that if you want a trading center in the Middle East. What can she offer? The glory of the Lord has shone upon you and the nations will come for that. That's the picture. They will come from the east. And therefore they will have to come on the ships of the desert, the camels. And so the camels are described in verses 6 and 7. Camels will come from the east. From the west they will come in ships. From Tarshish, which in those days was somewhere near Gibraltar, the place to which Jonah fled. The furthest extremity of the, the Mediterranean Sea. They will come from the west by ship. They will come from the east by camel. They will come from the north. They will come from the south. Jews will come, Gentiles will come, everybody will be making a pilgrimage, not to Mecca, but to Jerusalem. Because God's glory will shine there. It's funny, but we seem to have had, had doves in quite a number of passages recently, and it says the sails of the boats coming up the Mediterranean will be like doves coming to their dovecoat, fluttering up in the wind and bringing the sons and daughters of Israel back home. It's a, a wonderful picture, difficult to imagine, yes. Can you imagine all the world pilgrimage to Jerusalem to get the light of God's glory? It's an amazing picture. Not only will the people come, but the wealth of the world will come. They'll not only bring themselves, they'll bring silver and gold. The wealth of the nations will be poured into God's city. And that's repeated a number of times. It's there at the end of verse 5. Do you notice it? The wealth of the nations. It's there at the end of verse 11. The wealth of the nations. Glance to the next chapter, verse 6, the end of verse 6, 61. The wealth of the nations, and so it goes on. Isn't it strange the Jews have been so dedicated to getting the wealth of the nations in trading, and here God is going to give it to them. Here it will be poured in voluntarily to their city, without having to work for it or do business for it. The wealth of the nations will pour into God's city. We'll see why in a moment. And so verses 10 to 16 move on to this great immigration of foreigners bringing their wealth with them. They won't even be able to shut the gates day or night because the pilgrims bringing their wealth will come in and that wealth will help to build the city. It will help to build the walls. They'll have to keep their gates open day and night. And with verse 11 we come to the first quote from the book of Revelation. For of the new Jerusalem in Revelation, it is said, the gates will never be shut. Free traffic, day and night. Now in the eastern cities, the gates are shut every night for safety. I've stayed in little Arab towns in the heart of the Arabian desert. 
inside the walls and each night the gates are shut tight. But the traffic will be such they'll just have to keep them open day and night for the people pouring in, helping to build the city, bringing their wealth. Furthermore, nations that do not come will perish. Now that sounds a bit like blackmail to some, as if God said, unless you come and visit my city, you've had it. Arabs sometimes think like that. We were on the direct route for pilgrims up to Mecca. And as they dyed their beard and hair ginger and then set off for Mecca, probably with their life savings to pay for the journey there, not knowing how they'd come back, some of them dying before they come back, they came because they believed that if they did this pilgrimage it would save them. That if they got to Mecca and Medina, the two holy cities of the Muslim world, they'd know salvation. But that's not the blackmail here. It isn't blackmail here. It's a simple fact that when the glory of the Lord is available and the light of the Lord is shining, the people who refuse to come to it will perish. When God is shining clearly and inviting people to come and bathe in the glow of his glory and they refuse to come, then they will perish. It's a simple statement of fact that nations that come will be blessed but that nations that don't come will perish and be utterly laid waste. Even the physical glory of the city will be wonderful. The walls will be built, the gates will be open, the buildings will go up, and the trees will be planted. Somehow, deep in our hearts, we know that what makes a place attractive are the trees. We are very fortunate in living in an area that is heavily wooded, and how beautiful it makes this area to live in, the Chiltern Beaches. And from time to time, man has had dreams of garden cities and has built well in and other garden cities in which trees have been there to beautify the place where people live. According to my Bible, the new Jerusalem is to be a garden city. The leaves of the tree will be for the healing of the nations. And here we have a tree-lined city, the cypress, the plain and the pine. The glory of the forests of Lebanon will be theirs. Do you know that since 1948, over 15 million trees have been planted in Israel alone? It's changing the whole scenery of that little plot of land which we call the Holy Land. The sons of those who oppressed you shall come bending low to you. Here is a reversal of Israel's position in the nations. Instead of being oppressed, instead of being despised, instead of being the subject of jokes and contempt, here are the descendants of those who did those things coming to bow down and saying, you have something that no other nation in the world has. The glory of the Lord shines upon you. The third thing chapter 60 says is that because of all this, this city will be the most desirable place to live in in the whole world. And people will say, you ought to go and buy a house there. You ought to go and live there if you can. If you can get inside those walls, you're safe. They will call your walls salvation. If you can get through those gates, you'll praise God. They will call your gates praise. They will say that's the place to be. It's the place you find salvation. It's the place you praise God. So they call your walls salvation and your gates praise. For within those walls will be found these things according to verses 17 to 22. Prosperity. With all that wealth pouring in, they won't use common building materials instead of bronze gold. Instead of iron, silver. Instead of wood, bronze. Bronze doors, not wood doors. Instead of stones, iron. Prosperity. Secondly, justice. The Jews had known evil taskmasters. They had known cruel overseers. But the overseers in Jerusalem will be peace and the taskmaster's righteousness, fairness. There will be peace, there will be no violence, no destruction, no devastation, no war. There will be light, there will be no sun and moon, and with this we come to quote number two. In the book of Revelation it says of the new Jerusalem, no need of sun or moon, when God shines, then his glory is enough light, and the city is bathed in a glow. Of course, when God is not present, even the sun goes out, as it did on that dreadful day when Jesus died. But when God's glory shines, you don't need the sun. How we love a lovely sunny morning. A number of you have already commented to me on this. What a lovely day it is. 
Isn't it lovely coming to church on a day like this and walking in the sun? What will it be like to walk in the glory of the Lord, to worship Him? That's what's said here in verse 19. Happiness will be there. The days of mourning will be over. There will be no bereavement. There will be no sorrow. There will be no mourning. The days of human unhappiness will be gone. Goodness will be there. Your people shall all be righteous. Have you ever wanted to live in a town where everybody was good? Can you imagine that? This is where our imagination boggles. We, we find it difficult to imagine a place in which everybody's good. But Jerusalem will be like that. Here is the promise of God. Your people shall all be righteous, that I might be glorified. That's what it's all about. It is primarily, all this is primarily for God's glory, that people may say what a wonderful God he is, to have a city like this as his city and as his capital. There will be plenty of children in it too. Verse 22. The least one shall become a clan and the smallest one a mighty nation. I am the Lord. In its time I will hasten it. And the final question chapter 60 poses is, what is the time when all this will happen? In its time. When? Well, may I postpone that question to the end of this morning. Let's move on quickly to chapter 61. Chapter 61 has a different theme. The key word of chapter 60 was glory, glorious, glorified, which occurred one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine times in chapter 60. Glory, glorified, glorious. But in chapter 61, that word tends to drop out. And another group of words comes in. Rejoice, exult, joy, gladness. These are the words of chapter 61. Now we're not looking at this world civilization that is full of the glory of God. We are now looking at the citizens of this city. And as we look we see how glad they are. They're happy people. Why? Well now at this point the prophet speaks in his own name. The prophet speaks quite personally. The prophet was speaking to people who were in captivity. People who were far from the city of Jerusalem, they were in Babylon in chains, they were slaves. They had lost their home, they would lost their land, they would lost everything. Many of them had lost their children and their old people as they trekked 500 miles through the desert. Force marched in two months. And they were sad, so sad they couldn't even sing as I want to say tonight. They couldn't even sing. And they hung up their musical instruments on the trees. And to these people, the prophet Isaiah said this, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. He's anointed me to bring good tidings to the afflicted, to, to bind up the brokenhearted, to set at liberty those who are bound, to open the doors of the prison to those who are captive. He's anointed me to do this. Now, I can think of few more lovely things to do than to tell people good news. Can you? Isn't it delightful if you're given the holy and lovely privilege of going to someone and say, I've got really great news for you. Her Majesty the Queen has pardoned you and the last ten years of your prison sentence are cancelled. You can come out now and go home to your family. Would you like to go and tell someone that? Great news. There are all sorts of good news. Just imagine those moments when you've been able to take good news to someone. Haven't you felt a thrill? But you didn't need the Spirit of the Lord God to say that, did you? Why then did the prophet Isaiah need the Spirit of the Lord to anoint him just to tell them the good news? The answer is, as it is for me today, preaching good news from this pulpit, the answer is twofold. First, that without the Spirit of the Lord you wouldn't have any good news to give them because how would you know that the future was going to be bright? It takes the Spirit of the Lord to reveal to us what the future is, what the good news is. And without the Holy Spirit, I wouldn't have any good news to preach from this pulpit. Secondly, without the Holy Spirit's anointing, you wouldn't believe the good news. You'd say, no, I can't accept that, I can't believe that. I just can't accept this. But the Holy Spirit can anoint a preacher in such a way that you're absolutely convinced that what he says is true. Think of the great good news of the forgiveness of sins. That's great news. That God can wipe your slate clean. And you could find that very difficult to believe. You could say, I can't forgive myself for doing these things. How can God forgive me? I can't forget these things I've done. How can God wipe them out if I can't forget them and if I can't forgive myself? 
But the Holy Spirit's anointing can convince you that this good news is true. And so the good news of God needs the Holy Spirit's anointing. First, because the person who announces it must be convinced of its truth. And second, because the people to whom he announces it must be convinced. And so the prophet Isaiah comes to these weary, disheartened, disillusioned, sad people and says, the Spirit of God has anointed me to give you good news. You're going to be set free. You're going to go back home. And God is going to wreak vengeance on those who took you away. And I've come to proclaim the day of God's favor to you and the day of the vengeance of God to your enemies. I've come to comfort those who, who mourn. I've come to take away your ashes of mourning and put a garland upon you. I've come to give you gladness instead of sorrow. You're going to go back. You're going to be planted in your own land and you'll be called the oaks of righteousness, planted forever. You're going to rebuild those ruined cities. You're going to restore the buildings. Now that's good news. And the prophet said, the Holy Spirit anointed me to tell you this good news. And they believed it because he was so anointed. But as I read these words, you think of another. One day, Jesus went back to the synagogue in his hometown, where he'd been brought up as a boy. And he was invited to preach before his relatives and friends. That, I know from experience, is one of the hardest things to do. They've known you as you were. They knew you as a boy. They knew you as you grew up. They knew all your faults. They knew all, all your weaknesses. And they say, who is this getting up in the pulpit to preach in front of us? They said this about Jesus. Is not this the carpenter's son? We hear all about these miracles and great sins. He's preaching elsewhere, but we never saw anything of that when he was here. He's just the boy we used to send for when the window frame needed mending and when we needed a new door, he made it. Who is this? But he was invited by the local rabbi, would you like to read the lesson and then say something to us? And Jesus said yes. And they handed him a big roll of paper, of, of parchment, and said, here you are. This is the book we're studying just now in the synagogue, the book of Isaiah. So he picked it up. And he unrolled it to this very chapter I've just read. And he said, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because he has anointed me to bring good tidings to the afflicted. And he read it through. And he stopped at a comma, and then he sat down, and the preachers in those days sat to preach. I think that's quite a nice idea. But uh, that's what the phrase ex-cathedra means, from the seat. And to pronounce ex-cathedra is to pronounce from the throne, from the seat of your authority. And Jesus sat down and he spoke ex-cathedra, and he said, Today, this scripture is coming true before your very eyes today. In other words, he was saying, just as Isaiah the prophet was anointed to bring good tidings to the poor, I'm anointed to do the same thing. I have exactly this anointing on me, and if you want to know why I'm preaching sermons now, and why I'm healing the sick, and raising the dead, and cleansing the leper, if you want to know how it's done, it's done by the same power that anointed Isaiah. But do you notice where Jesus stopped reading? Isaiah's good news to the Israelites in Babylon was this is the day of God's favor and the day of the vengeance of our God upon your enemies. Jesus didn't read that. Not because he thought God was so loving that he wouldn't ever have vengeance. God is a God of vengeance. The New Testament says that. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord, Romans 12. But because Jesus didn't come to inaugurate the day of vengeance of our God, that's yet to come. But he did come to bring the day of God's grace. And so he stopped reading before Isaiah did. Now Isaiah went on because it was the day of God's vengeance against Babylon when Isaiah preached. So that the Spirit of the Lord brought the good news. Verses 5 to 9 states what will be the relationship between the foreigners who come and live in the city of God and the Jews who were already there. And the answer is the foreigners will do all the manual labor. Now lest you immediately begin to jump to conclusions here and wrong conclusions, may I explain why? They will say to the Jews, you have God. You can teach us about God. You can share God's glory with us. We want you to be set free from daily labor because we want you to be our minister. And the Jews will be called the ministers of God and the foreigners will stand and feed your flocks and be your plowmen and vine vessels. Now that is precisely 
what you do to me in order that I may minister to you in the things of God and spend time preparing the food for you then you go to your daily work and by your gifts you support me that I may feed you on Sunday spiritually just as within our home my wife has to go out and shop and come back and prepare the food and cook it and is released from daily employment by my earnings so that she can feed the family in exactly the same way there is no distinction of honor here there is simply a division of function and this is what will happen in the new Jerusalem here the Jews will all be the priests and the ministers and the others will all do the work so that they can give time to this and if I may add my work is very much like my wife's it may take my wife a couple of hours to go out and shop and come home and prepare and cook and, and put it on the table and it's gone in 12 minutes flat and in precisely the same way it takes about 10 times as long to prepare this meal for Sunday morning the Bible study as it does to give it but that's the whole point of setting someone apart to do this and the Jews will be set apart here to be ministers and so they will be supported you shall eat the wealth of the nations and in their riches you shall glory you won't need to run businesses to get your money they will give it to you and say will you be our minister will you teach us you've got the glory of the Lord will you share it with us and so instead of dishonor they will rejoice in their lot and in their land they shall possess a double portion God's covenant with them is that they would be seen to be a people whom the Lord has blessed verses 10 to 11 finally say they will rejoice exult not in the money they're getting not in the position they get not in the honor of being ministers and priests they will not rejoice in any of these things they will rejoice in God and in the Lord and they will rejoice in the Lord because he has clothed them with the garments of salvation and two pen pictures are drawn now the picture of a wedding with the bridegroom getting all spruced up for his wedding and the bride getting all adorned and beautified that's the first picture he's been to Musbrass and there he is in his glad rags and, and, and she's been off to get uh, all her things ready they're both attractive as attractive as they can be and, and the prophet says as a bridegroom decks himself as a bride adorns herself God's people will be beautified in salvation the garments of salvation or to change the metaphor look at the lovely gardens you can see around here the flowers that spring up God will, God will cause to spring up out of his people like flowers in a garden righteousness and praise most attractive finally chapter 62 looks at the city and the prophet says I can neither keep silent nor have any rest until all this happens until the city of God is like a crown in God's hands like a royal diadem now on Blue Peter my children were watching a uh, little program about the crown jewels which are worth 20 million pounds did you know that? 20 million pounds gleaming, glistening and there was somebody just holding it in their hand God will hold Jerusalem like a royal diadem like a crown of jewels in his hand I will neither be silent nor rest until I see this and the new names will be given no longer called Azuba, forsaken, but Hefzibah, my delight is in her. No longer called Sheminah, desolate, but Beulah, married, with a family, somebody sought by others. And then in verses 6 to 9, the prophets, the watchmen on the walls, will neither be silent nor take rest till this happens. And again foreigners are particularly mentioned because they will respect the property of Israel and will no longer take it and ravage the crops and take the wine. They will leave Israel to have her own products in peace. And finally in verses 10 to 12 comes the magnificent appeal. Take the words that I'm preaching, says Isaiah, take them to the uttermost parts of the earth. Go through the gates. Get the roads ready. Clear the stones off the roads so they can come easily and smoothly and quickly. Get ready for this great influx, this great immigration. How do you get ready? Why you go to the ends of the earth and you say to the daughters of Zion, Behold, your salvation is coming. That's what you do. And the words of salvation must go out to the ends of the earth to prepare for this great day. And that, I believe, is happening now. And so we finish up with this tremendous statement that the people shall be called the holy people. The Jews have been called many other things in their time. 
some respectable, many not so respectable. But in that day they shall be called the holy of the, the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. And the city, which again has been called many things and has been divided and forsaken and destroyed, that city will be called sought out. A city not forsaken. So I finish with the question, when will all this happen? That's a very important question. Is this just a pipe dream? Is it just a picture in the prophet's mind? Is it just wishful thinking? Or will it happen? Well, let me finish by giving you what I feel after studying the Bible carefully is my own answer. It's as if the prophet is looking through a telescope and the future is, is telescoped together. If you look at a, a range of mountains through a telescope, they all look as if they're together. But if you went and explored them, you'd find that between the first one and the second was quite a long journey and so on. And it's as if he's looking at three or four different periods of history through a telescope and sees them all together and sees the whole development in one glimpse. Undoubtedly, a little bit of all this came true when they came back from exile. What was the year? 587. I think, was it? No. Sorry, I'm getting that wrong. We'll just put exile and I'll look it up for you. <laughs> when they came back from exile, from Babylon, they brought with them the wealth of Babylon to rebuild the city, which the people of Babylon had been ordered to give them by Cyrus. And so they began to rebuild the city with the wealth of other nations. But only a little bit of these three chapters came true then. The nations didn't seek Jerusalem for God's glory. So you just can't say that fulfilled it. It fulfilled a little bit of this, but not much. Then, A.D. 48, 1948, when the state of Israel was re-established, some people think that that's when all this came true. And certainly the wealth of the nations poured into Israel and is still doing. Look at the size of the German reparation figure. And yet you know the nations still don't seek Jerusalem for God's glory, perhaps because God's glory is not yet shining fully on them. So I don't think that is the fulfillment, though I think we are seeing in our day even more of these things coming near. There is a period at the end of history to which we give the name the millennium, which means a thousand years. A period mentioned in the book of Revelation in which Jesus will reign on the earth in righteousness and peace and will bless his people and lead them to faith in himself. And I can see even more of this being fulfilled in that period. And that will be after our Lord has returned to earth. And in that Jerusalem one can see so much of this coming true. And yet I still don't think all that we have studied this morning will come true then. Right at the end of the Bible is the new Jerusalem. A city not built by men on earth, but built by God in heaven and sent down from heaven. Like a bride adorned for her husband. A city whose gates shall always be open that the kings of the nations might come in. A city in which there will be no sun and no moon, for the glory of the Lord will shine upon it. When I study that city at the end of the Bible, I find that everything we've studied this morning comes true. So that in a sense, I have the feeling that the prophet is looking through his anointed telescope, if I can put it that way, and he can see four mountain peaks of history he can see four periods in which these things begin to come true. But he's ultimately looking to the city whose builder and maker is God, a city which Abraham himself looked for. And so if we would look for the ultimate and final fulfillment of all that is said in these chapters, I think we need to look right through all these four to the final city of God, which we yet look for sent down from heaven. How do I imagine a city 1,500 miles square coming down out of heaven to earth, God's metropolis? I can't imagine that. But I honestly believe I'll see it. And that is part of the great Christian hope for the future. May I suggest that during the five minutes we wait while the children are coming in, that you take your hymn book and that you turn right to the end of it. And that you look at number 872 in the hymn book. And that you spend a few moments while the children are coming in, reading through number 872 as a kind of private meditation on the future.